you pick up water somewhere. You need water more than anything. Headquarters calling, headquarters one chief for glory. Gentlemen, the self-contained breathing apparatus is one of your most important pieces of personal protective equipment. Your ability to use this equipment directly affects your safety and the teamwork and safety of your brother firefighters on the fire ground. Okay guys, this morning we're going to talk about the turnout you received yesterday. It consists of your bunker pants with your boots, your turnout coat, helmet, your mask, which is nice and clean at the moment. Uh, but after a few working fires, it's going to be all scratched up, but it will make a bit of difference anyway. You're not going to be able to see anything in a working fire, it doesn't matter. Gentlemen, teamwork is essential to your survival on the fire ground. It is through teamwork that you will stretch hose lines, raise ladders, and perform rescues. You are now part of a much greater team. You are now part of the Newark Fire Department. Congratulations. It has been since 1889 that Newark's Bravest have been a professional paid department, responding to many alarms to protect the lives and property in the largest city in the state of New Jersey. Unfortunately, they have lost many men in doing so, men with families who go to work expecting the unexpected, to do what they can so that other families do not suffer devastation, even if it takes their own lives, for it is in their hearts to do so. It is the oath they take the moment they step foot in the firehouse. The very thought of you And I forget It all started back in 1884 when Chief Engineer Charles A. Bannon requested a permanent paid department. On June 1, 1889, the paid callman system was created. 123 officers and men were hired to give their full time to work for the Newark Fire Department. As population grew, so did the need for additional manpower, which had risen to 172 total personnel. It was in 1892, Newark's first fallen hero had lost his life. Firefighter James Stivers of Engine 2 was killed when he fell off the apparatus while answering an alarm. By 1910, the motorization era had begun, when the first Chief's automobile was purchased, but it would be 13 years later before the entire department would be motorized. The Roaring Twenties brought motorization, but the Thirties brought Great Depression, 
and they hit the city hard. 100 men received layoff notices on April 1st, 1933. This would last for 15 days. The remaining firefighters gave up a day's pay to bring them back. The future would bring better, yet busier times. By 1938, manpower had risen to 665 officers and men. In 1903, one of the greatest inventors of the 20th century had filmed the Newark Fire Department. In his practice of the motion picture, Thomas Edison, whom rumor has it was a fire buff, used Truck Company 5 and Engine Company 12's headquarters on the corner of Belmont and Waverly Avenues to film probably one of the first true fire films ever. The movie, The Life of an American Fireman, along with dissolves and special effects, truly proved that Mr. Edison was ahead of his time, and we thank him for choosing the Newark Fire Department in his wonderful work. In 1942, a young man by the name of Reggie Frenchy Fredette was hired to proudly serve the Newark Fire Department at Engine Company 6. His sons George and Ray, in time, also became firefighters. Frenchy Fredette today stands as one of the last true members of the department's past. All I saw in him was the Newark Fire Department. I'll tell you how the department's running in 42. It was right after the Depression. The new old guys wanted a $500 increase in pay, and they were promised that. Then they were so depleted men, for 10, 12 years, no new blood came in. They said, oh, you can't have a raise, we've got to put new men on. Oh, so the old guys, they were mad because they were talking about putting new men on. There it goes, a $500 raise in pay. Matter of fact, I used to be the, I used to be the housekeeper. I used to buy all the supplies, the cork and the milk, and all that was big. That was a big thing during the war years, when everything was rationed, sugar and all that. When I go to the A&Ps to get the coffee ground up, they'd say to the customers, oh, we don't have no coffee, and they'd hear me in the back room grinding up the coffee, and they could smell it. A&Ps used to take care of the firehouse. They always took care of us, real good. Well, right after the 47 is when the new guys came in from World War II. Then we started getting a little blood in, you know, young blood. Well, I was old when I came in. Uh, I was about 32 years old when I came oh, in yes. the job. Because uh, there was no examination for 10, 12 years. And uh, if you just missed the other group, like that ended in 1930, uh, there was nobody, nobody come in. And the other old guys, they started getting old, they couldn't drive anymore, they couldn't take the lines in. It was like, when I got old, you couldn't move that two and a half inch. If you're in a fourth battalion, you have so many fires, so much experience, you know what to do. Same way, the best cops in the city are in the fourth battalion. Why? The experience. If you're like in a small town, you don't have all the experience. The busier you are, the more experience you get and the better you become. In 1949, the addition of the third tour had not come at a better time. In the 1950s, the fire department would see an increase in fires when one of the largest fires in the department's history took place on July 7, 1951 at the Warren Maritime Corporation in the Down Neck area. It was a serious propane fire that expelled a series of explosions. The first off-duty recall of department members was used getting more help in battling fires of this degree, in addition to a county mutual aid response. On March 11, 1953, 13 workers were killed in a brewery plant fire with 31 others seriously injured. By 1955, the department's manpower was rising. Earlier that year, on April 4th, another serious fire occurred at the Naval Pier in Port North. Several firefighters escaped serious injury or even death when a crane on the pier had collapsed. Engine 10's hose wagon was not so lucky. It was buried beyond repair as the fire had suddenly taken off. As alarms continued to rise, special service 
and supply company number one was formed. And later this decade, the arson squad. Due to the continuing increase of fires, on March 1st, 1959, a fourth and final tour would be added to complement a 778 member staff. The future would shock the city and the department as well. Fireman? Oh, that's the best part of my life. Sure. There's nothing I like better. Even being a bartender wasn't as good as being a fireman in sex. Uh, I love it. As a matter of fact, I used to be glad to go back to work from a vacation. You had a good captain, you had a good crew. And that good crew would make the chief look good. But if you had a lousy chief, you didn't get good men. Wickes and Manger got killed at South Orange on Prince Street. And the alarm came in at 13th Avenue and Rutgers Street. And instead of going to fire, I went down the next block because the street was blocked up. And I see this reflection in a arrow building alone. Uh, this car and, and uh, 20 engine met at Princeton South Orange Avenue. Whitgers and Manga both got killed. And the three people in, the, in a private car, they got killed. His five of them died in one accident. Did you know Big Ed Breezy? Fire truck. I mean, you say they pull down the ceiling. He thought that the ceiling he meant the roof. Down come the whole roof. Big guy, big guy, big head busy. But he gave you ventilation. He gave you ventilation. We knew a fire truck, three truck, they're responding. We knew we could go in without a mask a little bit further because fire truck or three truck was going to ventilate from us. A truck would say, I can go in because six, 12, or 20 are going to come in with water. We knew it was only a matter of seconds. We depended upon each other. The only thing is we wouldn't give up our hose to them. Now, give it to your members of your own company, but don't ever give it up to a guy from another company. They'll say, go get your own goddamn hose. We were taught that. We were taught that. Never give up. A guy would be on a ladder overhauling a building, and you'd say, no, you come on down. And, uh, Another man, I uh, uh, say six inch, and we'll go up. We'll, t we'll take care of it. Don't ever give it up. And everybody's heard about the bird. In the 1960s, the fires in the city began to take off and continued for the next three decades. False alarms were also a serious problem. A large fire occurred on April 15, 1960, at Ferry and Mott Street and took four alarms to bring it under control. In April of 61, another fourth alarm fire at Inglehorn's Meatpacking Company would result in the death of firefighter Joseph Buell when an explosion caused the wall to collapse and crush him to death. Three other firefighters were seriously injured and would never return to duty. In 1964, the fireboat John F. Kennedy was placed into service. Also constructed this year was the first diesel engine company number six, a snorkel at truck company one, and a fire museum with dedication. But July 13th, 1967 had marked a sad day for the fire department and the city of Newark. Riots unleashed approximately two weeks of mayhem. As a result, 227 fires would be fought and a sniper would kill a fire captain. On July 15, 1967, Captain Michael Moran of Engine Company 11 was shot while checking the roof of a building for a fire condition. It was during the riots that task forces consisting of two engine companies, a truck company and a chief would respond to alarms. The end of this decade would see another of Newark's largest fires. In 1968, a fire at Avon Avenue and Bergen Street resulted in the destruction of 35 buildings. Some say, if not for Avon Avenue School, the fire could have resulted in a conflagration.
My name is Dan Preacher. Came on the job July 68, promoted to captain December of 89. I come on in July 68. I went to truck 11. I was in truck 11 for seven months. Then I went to truck nine. From truck nine, I went to truck five. Uh, I was on the job uh, almost two years before I was sent to the training academy to learn how to do the job. Uh, at that time, we had no training academy. It was up on 18th Avenue, but it wasn't an academy. It was people that worked up there, but no training courses. After a year and a half, they decided that all of us that were in the field, myself, the Jimmy Donlins, the Bobby Gaynors, guys like that, they decided we had a year and a half in the field. It's time we teach them what to do. Chief Donlin, who had some uh, good film, you had a uh, when we had the Newark slip, I think that was in 70, I'm going to say 74, 75, I don't really only remember the dates. Being as he was a, a battalion chief at the time, I think he was, uh, he was able to get inside the building and go with us, catch us wherever we went. You would turn around on the roof, you would have Chief Dolan on the roof with you, the roof with you, whether it be a peak roof or a flat roof, no matter what, but you always had him in there. Uh, other people later on when the VCR started coming in you got the Donnie Vanetcheks and the guys like that that would show up and uh, take care. Uh, my time in 59 and the, and the 60s uh, Engine 10 was one of the busier companies with it was 6, 10, 12 and 20 that uh, were the busiest engine companies at that time and it seemed like we were, we were always working and even though there were more alarms after that. I, I think there was less fires. The busy section of the city went from the Central Ward to the North Ward to to Balesburg in these days. Uh, the South Ward, uh, a lot of fires there. It uh, it just varied. Now, whereas uh, those companies I mentioned before were busy then, maybe they're not the busiest now, I have no idea. I grew up in a neighborhood and I knew the neighborhood well. Um, there weren't many streets that mystified me and uh, I did study the Red Book, so I drove for most of my years in 10 engine. I, I worked with some great captains. When I went on a job, we had an old German by the name of Herman Brunner. They called him Ham, uh, super guy. Wouldn't let anybody get hurt, wouldn't let anybody go where he didn't take them. And uh, unfortunately, age caught up with him and he ended up in special service. Uh, then Davy Kinnear was my captain there. Davy was also super. His, uh, his dad was retired battalion chief and uh, made no bones about coming to fires and, and telling us afterwards what we did right, what we did wrong. Uh, Davy was another captain that was right there on the front of the line, so it, it was good work with him. Joe Dahl was on the second tour then uh, as the captain, and uh, he was another great guy. Uh, it, it was a house of, um, I think we were riding one in five then. Uh, everybody got along good. We had no problems. Going back to the old days, uh, you could always rely on certain people being there. Uh, Jimmy Donlins and Doc Devlins. I don't know if you ever heard of Doc Devlin, but he was always there. Doc Devlin was uh, Deck Gun Devlin, we called him. He would come to any any multiple alarm, and if a fireman was injured, just look up in the sky wherever there was a deck pipe going, and that's where you find Doc Devlin, and he was there immediately to take care of you. In the 1970s, disco was rising on the charts, but so were the total alarms of the Newark Fire Department. One would think more companies would be added, instead they were disbanded. 
the old filter masks were replaced with the MSA and Survive Air SCBAs. 1972 marked the busiest year in modern day history with a sum of 22,223 total alarms. This includes 5,716 structure fires and continues today to be an all-time record high. This decade, six firefighters lost their lives in four separate incidents. A collapse during operations at a third alarm fire at Orchard and Penitent Streets resulted in the deaths of Fire Captain Anthony Lardier of Truck Company 4, Captain Dominic Latour of Engine Company 12, and Firefighter Russell Schomer of Truck Company 5. A new training academy had been put into service during 1974 and EMS was started. This would last for two years before being taken over by the state. In 1975, a large fourth alarm fire occurred at the North Slip Works Complex at 411 High Street. At the same time, a second alarm fire across the city resulted in a rare off-duty recall and mutual aid response from 31 towns and two counties. The governor had declared a state of emergency. On December 8, 1973, 12 people were killed in a three-story frame building at a second alarm fire that gutted a building on South 12th Street near Avon Avenue. During 1979, reduced assignments on box alarms started between 0800 and 2400 hours, and full assignments were sent at 2400 to 0800 hours. With alarms still rising, the next decade would reach record highs. Although I know in 81, uh, 6 engine did 5,010 alarms and the 4th Battalion did over 5,700 runs. It's not a simple uh, task. Uh, it's a great job. Uh, there's uh, a lot of training that's necessary before you get into uh, the real nitty gritty of fighting fires. And uh, most of that is uh, actually. Uh, learned in the respective companies and battalions. Uh, we have a great fire academy, initial uh, whatever it is now, 30 days, you, you learn a good percent of the basics. But the actually, uh, the day in, day out uh, job, the activity, the fires uh, is learned on the job and through your company officers and men, your fellow uh, firefighters. I don't think anybody can do the job. You have to be, um, it has to be in you. I know civil service or the Department of Personnel uh, has a way of, uh, of uh, selecting individuals that they think are qualified to go to the academy based on their experience, uh, based on their, uh, uh, their testing uh, and their uh, background check. And then it starts at the, uh, the academy with uh, whether you have it or you don't have it and uh, I always said to uh, individuals that uh, you could be uh, you could be a great guy 
or you can be uh, less than a great guy, but as long as you know your limitations, uh, you can serve in a slower company and do a great job, and then again, if that guy in a slower company goes up to uh, the busiest company, he might not fit in. But uh, there's, there's a level where you find, and you've got to depend upon the captains and the battalion chiefs and the deputy chiefs. I really enjoyed the job. Uh, when I was in a slower company, I couldn't wait to go to a busier company. Though total alarms were reaching record highs, the fire department would endure layoffs and company closings. The 1980s saw the end of the two two-piece companies. Engine 9 and 10 had lost their hose wagons, and the first inch and a half hose line was replaced with the new inch and three quarter hose line. On May 28, 1980, a total of 30 working fires were reported in a 24 hour period. Yet 1981 marked the busiest year ever recorded in the history of the Newark Fire Department. With the sum of 28,008 total alarms in a city surrounded by a 24 mile radius, Newark was dubbed the arson capital of the world for profit. In 1983, a Texaco storage plant saw an explosion that would be heard and seen for miles. In the 1980s, three firefighters lost their lives in the line of duty. Firefighters Harry Halpin, James Murray, and Marcus Reddick had each lost their lives at three separate alarms. Also this decade, the Essex County Emerald Society was formed to assure that no fire or police line of duty death would ever pay for a pipes and drums band at a funeral. The busiest decade had combined for 210 thousand total alarms, 20,700 structure fires, and 223 total deaths. On November 21st, 1989, as the decade was coming to an end, a fourth alarm fire, fueled by high winds, attacked at least 16 buildings. It was another of Newark's largest fires, as a rare mutual aid call was made to assist in its extinguishment. Many people had lost their homes in sub-freezing temperatures. Uh, we were fire death capital of the, of the world for a long period of time, primarily because of the structures and the type of individuals that resided and the people that come in from the outside and torch them. Uh, we had as many as 48 fire deaths in a year. I mean, uh, the average was probably 24, 25, but we were as high as 48, somewhere in between. We were the fire death capital. In the 80s, we hit our peak period, I believe. And uh, I see the workload coming down from what they tell me. And from when I, when I retired in 94 or 95, the workload was descending. Um, I, think the, I think the department is, is, uh, is in the right, uh, has gained a lot of uh, 
of uh, recognition, a lot of prestige. I think the training and, uh, and the equipment is top notch. Uh, the caliber of officers, uh, the vast improvement. If you go back to 62, it's like everything else. Uh, modernization, uh, the selection process I think is right up there as far as uh, recruits. I think the uh, officers are very capable and uh, I'm proud to say that I served uh, uh, 32 years on, on the York Fire Department, ascended to the rank of uh, deputy chief. In the 90s, three firefighters lost their lives in the line of duty. Captain Joe McCarthy, firefighter Michael Delane, and firefighter Richie Hines lost their lives on three separate incidents. Though structure fires started to decline, so did manpower. The membership was challenged with rotational closing, which would close four companies per tour. This would last through the decade. Companies riding with one officer and four men were reduced to one and three. This decade saw two distinguished landmarks that defined the North North community. Both Biazzi's and Vesuvius restaurants perished with Biazzi's beyond the repair. Though Newark was not set in record highs, the big fires still challenged the department on a consistent basis. Newark continued to be the busiest in the state. Low frequency, high risk incidents around the country, such as Oklahoma City and the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, raised awareness on terroristic threats, as well as secondary devices to kill first responders. With safety and accountability enforced, bunker gear replaced the old coats and boots, as well as Nomex clothing, which became mandatory. In 1999, Monsignor Horton Roth, the fire department chaplain, died of natural causes. He will never be forgotten. The next decade would shock the city, as well as the entire world. Almighty God, with you there is no beginning <coughs> and no end. You are the origin and goal of all creation. Pour out the grace of your blessing upon all here present. Bless these men. For God our Father is our strength in adversity, our health in weakness, our confident sorrow. Help us to play our part in the life of our city, that our service may be directed towards peace and justice and the living service of all our community. Bless all these members of our fire department, oh Lord. Newark firemen today gave a hero's funeral for a comrade who gave his life to save another. Actually, 26-year-old Marcus Reddick saved two lives. He was killed last week trying to rescue a fire victim.
tonight, a heroic young fireman has been laid to rest. Uh, yeah, she was a nice young man. I tell you, that's good. Hundreds of firefighters from all over the area joined together this morning in Newark to say farewell to a fallen comrade. 33-year-old fireman Michael Delane died Saturday in the line of duty. Vultures and thieves at your back Storm keeps on twisting Keep on building lies that you made Whether it would have made a difference today, only God will know, but we need our companies back permanently on a full-time basis. We can't gamble anymore with the lives and property of the citizens. And this is a perfect example of it. It's easier to believe in this sweet madness All this glorious sadness that brings me to my knees Final farewell to a fallen firefighter today in New Jersey. Family, friends, and colleagues gathered to remember Lawrence Webb, who died this week in the line of duty. They strive to serve you in their fellowship of men by their dedication and service. Bless all our firefighters as we honor this day for those who prove their bravery and service in this present pledge of loyalty and dedication to the citizens of our city and the protection of life and property. Today and always, may you be within God's loving care. And by his grace and goodness, may he forever bless you, your home, and those you love with lasting happiness. We ask this for the blessing of Almighty God. Amen. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just ream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other Officials side. Officials at Somerset County Airport say a large plane has crashed just north of the airport. That's about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. The FAA has ordered all air travel stop. Unclear in all of these attacks, the number of dead and injured. We began to get reports of events taking place in Washington. A huge cloud of smoke. This is devastation. Catherine, I'm about to this had to be the worst thing you've ever seen. Would you dance? Our lives will never be the same. If I asked you to dance. South Tower, the second tower, collapsed. Would you run? And we were just in a cloud of darkness. We'll never look back. And we had to feel our way to clearness. Would you cry? That's when two World Trade Center blew up. If you saw me crying. We've been pretty much walking ever since. And would you save my soul? Tonight. The city of New York is pulling together in a time of need. Would you tremble if I touched your Washington, D.C. is utter chaos right now. Would you laugh? Echoes of 1941. Oh, please tell me. Firemen who put their lives in the line. Now would you die? And they know that it's bad out here. Would you love? And a woman from Manhattan talking to three women from Wisconsin. Put me in your arms. Who are here on their vacation, and she's offering them a place to stay. I can be your hero, baby. Perhaps a second day that will live in infamy. I can kiss away the pain. We're so frightened because we think something else is going to blow up. I will stand by you forever. The U.S. will track down those responsible for the destruction. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward and freedom will be defended. Would you swear that 
that you'll always be People are walking around in shock. Would you lie? He actually accelerated Would you run the into the building. And it exploded. Have I lost my mind? It's a scene of utter devastation. I don't care you're here. You heard a kamikaze sound effect out of a World War II movie. I can be your hero, baby. An emotional President Bush vowing to punish those responsible. I can kiss away the pain. I see no water going into that building. I will stand by you forever. He actually accelerated into the building. You can take my breath away. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I assume right now our nation is under attack and we're at war with some foreign body. The street is pretty much a war zone with the fact some believe it's turned into. There were intense fires following the aircraft's impact into the building. Every available emergency person has come in. Have I lost my mind? We haven't seen anything like it. Well, I don't care. You're here tonight. Since the day of infamy, the attack on Pearl Harbor. And I can be your hero. I ask the American people to join me. I can kiss away the pain. And sang a prayer for the victims and their no families. Stand by. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. Make no mistake. We will show the world that we will pass this test.